to last. Um, but thank you everyone for being here. Um, I'm really excited to be here with you. I love Dublin is a great city. Ireland's a beautiful country. Um, and it's excellent to be back here. Uh, my name is Megan Jaco. I will be presenting, um, a talk about let's cook, uh, contextual vulnerabilities. Um, and then looking at those mapped to OS top 10 and also thinking about like ingredients and seasoning. Um, and so we've got some chef hats over there that I'll be speaking about in a moment. Um, but really happy to have you all here with me on this journey. So what are, what are we going to be doing today? You know, like what, what's our recipe for today? Um, so, you know, we're going to discuss a problem that I think we all have. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of do a asking of a question for that. I uh, will do a very fast review of OWASP Top 10 to make sure we're all on the same page in the recipe book. Uh, and then we will do some seasoning, some ingredients with some data sets, and we'll do a threat modeling garnish. And then we'll close out um, with some time for questions, as well as hopefully sending you off to the closing ceremonies or on to your way for hopefully safe travels home um, at, at the end of the day. So who, who am I? So I said, my name is Megan Jaco. Um, I'm a security engineer, which is a really broad title, right? You know, that can mean many different things. I, in my company, Inspective, we do attack service management, um, vulnerability detection. Uh, we have a platform for that. And I do research on those vulnerabilities um, because we do both pen testing and bug bounty. So I get a lot of data. And I like to both look at the context of those vulnerabilities, the frequency of them, and then if it's happening a lot, um, maybe we can automate that. So I do a combination of research as well as scripting and then helping onboard with new clients too. Um, so, you know, we've got our three hats over there. So you could say I wear multiple hats. Um, I'm also someone who really enjoys giving back to conferences. So I'm a CFP reviewer for OWASP and SANS and a variety of other organizations. I help out with DEF CON. I'm a SOC goon. So if you hear people saying, like, make a hole and yelling, um, it, I might be one of those people if you see me at Hacker Summer Camp. I'm really a strong believer in being um, a mentor, but also receiving mentorship. So both a mentor and a mentee. And I absolutely love to travel. So I've kind of been all over the world. Um, have not been to Antarctica yet. Um, some of my friends here have, uh, but that's on my list to go to. And I, you know, within those adventures, I like to always learn something new. So I've gone on a variety of paleontological digs. Um, this is me excavating a triceratops. Um, and so that's at the Royal Ontario Museum in Canada. Um, but it's a lot of fun. I enjoy having these variety of adventures. So that's a little bit about me. A current project I'm working on that I'd love to have your involvement with is a book about cybersecurity and how people enter the field and how people are allies. So I'm gathering people's stories, and then that will get combined into a book. So um, if you saw on the first slide, there was a QR code for my slides. I'll also have that up again at the end, and then I'll publish these two in case you're like, scanning a QR code. Oof. Um, it, so that is one way to gain access to them, but I'll, I'll publish them and share them out. Um, so yeah, if you are interested in sharing your story, I'd love to have you be part of this project for this book that I'm working on. So I said we're going to start with a problem. What is the problem? Well, if you can see, it depends on where you're sitting in the room. You might not be able to see, but there's three hats on the table. There's three chef hats, okay? So, so who here, raise of hands, who here wears multiple hats in their role? I, I, I would imagine it's everyone. <laughs> like, if you said you don't, like, I'm going to kind of wonder, I'm like, what, what are you doing that you're only wearing one hat, that you're only doing one singular thing? So the problem is is that we often have too many hats, right? And so it's a struggle of time and resources and what to do with this, right? And so we can kind of think of this as, you know, the signal to noise ratio um, and how amongst all the different parts of our job, how amongst all the different bits of data that's out there, um, how do we actually find something that's meaningful to do something? And so when we think about these hats, you know, we've got those up here. When you think about those, you want to think about, you know, how can I maybe work on consolidating those? And we'll talk about that throughout this talk. So we're going to look at finding patterns. We're going to look at categorization and basically trying to quiet the noise um, that might be roaring in your ears for you. So this will be a very fast review, but I just wanted to level set, make sure we're all on the same page in that recipe book. So thinking through the OWASP top 10, 
is that's going to be a lot of what we're going to be focusing on. Um, so our first one's broken access controls. And you could think about it as, you know, this like sweet chinchilla here, her name's Cusco. Maybe she broke out of the cage and she's chewing on some things that she's not supposed to chew on. And so she is going into areas where her role should not be. And that could be dangerous. For our cryptographic failures, that's um, AO2, you can think about it as maybe a secret recipe. So like here in Dublin, we have Guinness and they have a secret recipe. Um, and that is behind, you know, you know, I'd imagine they have cryptography around that. And so if that cryptography gets broken, your secrets might get shared. So you think of like different data types too, also with this, because depending on geography, there might be different requirements. Injection is the third one. Um, and so you think about when we add too much of a thing to a recipe, right? So if anyone's ever had something that's like, you try it and you're like, that is way too salty. Or, oh, that's not how I like it. Or maybe it's too bland, right? And you need to inject something into that. So you need to add your own flavoring. So you can kind of think about that with injection. So it's malicious inputs. They might be leading to something that you don't expect. So kind of asking for something, receiving something else. Now, our next one is insecure design. So you think about maybe a recipe and you're like, how do, how do I follow this? What do I do? What are the techniques I should be using? So it's a very broad category. And I really like this quote from OWASP where they said, this is not <laughs> the source of all the other vulnerabilities. So really important to keep that in mind. So this is not the end-all be-all. It is itself its own category. Um, our next one we have is secure um, security misconfigurations, misconfigs. And so it, we could think about maybe there is a translation issue. You're going between metric and imperial for your measurement systems in this recipe. And then all of a sudden you have way too much baking soda and it just does not do what you expect, right? So it's a misconfiguration. It's not what you planned. After that, we have vulnerable and outdated components. So if anyone's ever looked in their pantry and they're looking through the expiration dates, like maybe for your spices and something's expired <laughs> and you're like, it's fine. I'm still going to use it anyways. These are things that are outdated. Now, a lot of the times, you know, especially with you think about spices, it might be that it's just not as potent anymore. Um, and so it might not be problematic to use it, but maybe then you need to add, you need to inject something. So maybe then you're chaining these vulnerabilities together um, to make it work the way you want it to work. Um, our next one with identity access management, we have to think about like who's actually doing that cooking. Like if you've anyone seen the movie Ratatouille, right? Who's behind that? Who's doing that? Um, and so that lack of identity um, can lead to all sorts of issues that might occur. And we have our second to last with imagine equipment that you have. Um, it could lead to a failure, right? So you have like temperatures you're trying to gauge and then you can't correctly trust the integrity of the data because of these failures that have happened. And maybe then you're like, oh, did my stove really go to this temperature? Did, did my oven go to that temperature? And you have a, a failure um, in regards to the cooking that you're doing. Um, and this can happen in a variety of different ways. It can be system compromises, it can be issues with the CICD pipeline, et cetera. So our final of the top 10, remember this was gonna be a very fast overview of these because this is not the major point of the talk, but I just wanted us to level set, um, is with logging. And if you're just at the talk that was in this room, that talk was about logging. So I definitely recommend checking that out. Um, and so if we are not monitoring logs, if we um, don't have any sort of secure logging, Maybe we burn our food because of lack of monitoring, right? Has anyone ever left something on a stovetop and just forgotten it? And then all of a sudden you realize you forgot it because you can smell it. Um, and I know that like even with like the pandemic, one of the big things that happened is people lost their sense of smell. They ended up burning things too because they weren't really paying attention to that. So um, that power of scent and smell is really, really important for monitoring in the way that we do monitoring. So... Um, and I said that was the last one, but I think it was off by one number. Um, so I forgot um, SSRFs. My apologies on that. Um, so with the server side um, registry failures, you think about like issues that might exist with the sourcing, right? Where did it come from? What is the source? Um, so like maybe if your source of information is only TikTok, I really hope not. But maybe if it is, you decided to do NyQuil chicken 
this past year. And you're like, yeah, I keep hearing about like cooking chicken and NyQuil. seems like it'd be amazing. I've got my chef's hat on. Lovely. Don't do that. It is very bad for you. <laughs> um, it, it was uh, something that's going pretty viral in the United States. I don't know how much of the rest of the world it hit. Um, but the FDA in the U.S. actually had to issue a warning to not cook your chicken in NyQuil, um, which is a cold medicine. Um, and that can be very dangerous for you uh, because it enhanced uh, a variety of chemical properties for it. And it was not, not good for your health. So kind of keep that in mind, um, the source of things. Okay. So that was our fast overview. Now we're going to get into our first data set. So this first data set is an open source data set. Um, it's published uh, every year. They've been doing this since 2015. And it is about zero days or O days uh, from Google Project Zero. And so um, their threat group um, tag, uh, their threat analysis group, uh, works on publishing out a report every year. It usually comes out in Q2 around like April. And then we can see different pieces with um, what they are doing with Threat Intel, um, how they're finding vulnerabilities, how people are reporting them to them, because it's not just them, it's also vendors who share. Um, and last year, they published two reports for the first time, um, and we'll kind of see why in a moment. And we're going to mainly look at the 2021 findings because they haven't published the 2022 findings, even though they published two reports in 2022. They were about 20, well, one of them was about 2021. One was a little bit about 2022. Um, and we're going to look at like some of the source data too. So that's going to be what we're going to be starting with for our first set. So here is a graph that shows us, you know, every year that they did the report and the increases, um, it, not always, but in the last several years, we've seen even a very dramatic rise in the number of zero days. So one of the things when you're looking at data sources, you have to think about like biases that exist too. Um, so one bias that I would caution you with is when we start to look for things to try to detect them, we often find them, right? Because we're actually now searching for it. So it could be that detection is getting better. More people are looking for zero days. And so that's why there are more of them because we are finding more of them. So it's not necessarily that there are more zero days, it's more that we are seeing them and finding them. Um, and so th those are some uncertainties with the data, but I just want to introduce that piece to it. Um, I'm going to be toggling between a little bit. So this is the report that they put out um, for this year. So I'll have this in all my sources, um, but they are really nicely done. They have executive summaries. Um, you can see this, and I, I did cite them for that. Um, it, but it does a walkthrough of these different vulnerabilities and the categories with them. Um, it, so that is going to be something that, if this is of interest to you, I would definitely recommend checking out. And what what are some of the big takeaways from it? So um, it, one is that 67% uh, of the zero days that they found were memory corruption-based. So we just went through the OS top 10. Was, were any of those memory corruption? Was that a title for anything? Can be connected to them. Yes, can be connected to them. But it's not a title from the 2021 set. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, that They are seeing two-thirds of them. And then also if you look at MITRE set, where they do the top 25 of the CWEs, I... Quite a few of theirs, including their number one, is also memory-based. So a couple of different things to think about when we're thinking through data sets and connecting them. There might be um, some issues with translation here, but they also look at different things sometimes because the Google Project Zero data is looking more broadly than just AppSec data. Um, a lot of it has to do with... Um, browser-based, server-based, which can affect apps, but is not strictly app-based. So um, some things to kind of think about with it. So the category that we're actually seeing is category A11, which you always hear about the top 10. Well, what's number 11? Um, and so sometimes we actually have to turn things up to 11. Um, and so that category of code quality issues, which itself is a massively broad category, includes memory management. So show of hands, how many had heard of A11 for the OS top 10? So we've got one. Yeah. 
Um, and so it's not, it is, this is on the OWASP website. Um, it, it is just not commonly known that that is the next one. Let's see if I correctly tab. Nope, too far. Ah. Let's see. Okay. Um, I will just fresh open that. Oh, I will not fresh open that. No. I was wearing my, my, uh, dinosaur tomorrow. Uh, yesterday, but yeah. Um, but basically that walks you through the code quality ones. Um, so a couple of the other things to note from their data set is, you know, when you have a zero day in your organization, I'm not sure how many of you have experienced that. Um, when that happens, you may not want to publish all the data about it. Um, you can think of very logical reasons why you wouldn't want to share out, oh, here's every different piece, and here's the attack vector, and here's this other element, and then this is the mitigation to it, right? Because, you know, if you publish all of that, what if you're publishing it before everyone who uses this has a chance to patch, right? And then what have you given the threat actors? Ah, here's a lovely roadmap for you. Here's a recipe for you to be able to go after this exploit. And let's, let's, you know, make a Metasploit module out of it too. Why not? Um, it, so it is somewhat common that with these, we might not have a lot of information. So if we're trying to map them, if we're trying to figure out putting together these seasonings and these ingredients, we might not necessarily be able to. We might have a little bit of information. So for example, this one said, um, it, it had crypto, it had cryptography in it. So we can maybe intuit it's probably a cryptographic failure, right? Like, I think that's a reasonable, logical, like, it's not really a leap. I think that's a reasonable, logical pathway. But there's just so little information that we can't verify that. So if we're looking at this, I'm having so much fun with tabs. If we're looking at this, which I don't think I have it. Yeah. Okay. Um, my apologies about my tabbing power of being on an angle. Um, this one here, I just basically says this and that it's, you know, a lower level um, criticality and just has almost no information on there. So um, it, there's very few details with that, so you can't confirm it. Versus this one here actually has a really, really nice report with it. Um, and so we can see that um, here. Uh, oh, that was our A11. Beautiful. So that was our A11 from before. Um, it, so you can see all these different pieces with the code quality. And then this, oh, here we go. So here's our CVE that has very little information. Now I'm on the same page. And then here is the CVE that I was saying actually has a really nice report for it. <laughs> so um, it, they did a nice full detail. They categorized it. They even gave us some examples of what it looks like. So that can be really helpful when you're both trying to analyze it as well as think through, you know, does this affect me, our systems, um, and how so, and can I test it? Uh, so that is really nice if you're able to have that level of information. So another one that you hopefully have heard about um, that was a fairly famous one from uh, this time span was uh, an SSRF-based one that also involved vulnerability chaining. Um, and this was actively exploited um, in the wild um, by threat actor groups and shared. So Hafnium was one of the major ones that was noted with it, but it tends to be that if you know one group finds something successful, maybe they got some buddies in another group, or maybe they work in two different groups. Um, and so this one uh, was found to be shared with other threat actor groups. Um, it, it was found uh, to be um, one that was both used in chaining, but then also uh, one that once the patches existed didn't exactly work. Um, it, so this vulnerability here can be a good one to look at for SSRF examples um, and also how vulnerabilities are working together. Uh, so very similar. Um, we have a really nice uh, we have really nice write-ups about it, but also we have ways that people can take advantage of this exploit. Um, and so 
that can kind of tell you like, hey, this one is going to be pretty easy for threat actors to use because there are multiple methods um, that exist sharing how to take advantage of it. Um, so those were all from 2021. I wanted to bring us to be a little bit more fresh with our data. Um, you know, we saw that uh, they started in 2015, but 2022 was the first year that they actually published two reports. So one of the neat things that they do is they also share out just the raw data before they've written a report. So we're going to look at that for a moment um, and then look at uh, just some frequency with that. Um, it, so, you know, they shared that, um, you know, they had found that 50% of vulnerabilities overall were related to previous vulnerabilities, but maybe they looked at the um, attack me um, vector, the methodology, and they're like, okay, this patch exists, but the root cause was not fixed. So let's make this slight variation, and this vulnerability will still work for us. And it then becomes like a new CVE, a new zero day, but it's really a variant on something that already existed. And so that is really, really common. I mean, even think about like your own work. So if you are scripting a lot, do you ever reuse some of your code in a new project? <laughs> Um, I, I, I give lots of presentations. I, I borrow from myself. I'm like, oh yeah, I remember I had this one visual that worked really nicely and I had this other piece. And so like I'll pull in slides from other presentations. Um, and so I'm sure there's many instances where we borrow from our own work and apply it to other things. And that, that's very similar to the situation. Um, so 22% are variants of previous vulnerabilities. Um, from 2021. Um, and then 50% were older vulns um, that had previously been patched. So 22% uh, were very, very recent. 50% were just like any time span. Um, so that's, that's quite a bit. Um, so if we look at our second report, uh, this is kind of a breakdown of the categories. So remember that memory corruption comes up again. So this is 2022 data. Um, and these are the two categories that we have for these zero days, um, with memory corruption being the vast majority of the data set. And then if we take a look at our raw data, um, it, we have got all of these tabs here at the bottom, giving all the different years. And so we've got 2022, which they've not written a report about yet. So that will come out uh, sometime this year, um, probably in April. And then we can actually start looking at 2023. So I was really curious, like, how fast did this get updated? Does anyone notice anything in here that's like, oh, I just saw that? Like, I noticed a couple of things that I'm like, oh, I, that was just in some write-ups I was reading about. That was just in some exploits I was looking at. So this gets updated pretty quickly as far as, like, the raw data set. And this is open source. Like, they, they're they freely sharing this. So um, if this is a, something that you're like, oh, let me grab this data... This is not my data. This is not, you know, this is everyone's data. Um, so definitely recommend taking a look at that just because you can start to look at for um, front else. Now, now, what category are all the 2023 vulnerabilities? Memory corruption. So we see that again and again, right? And so that's where, like, once again, going back to, like, what data we're looking at, um, you know, their data set is a little bit broader, than AppSec, but I think it's still really important for us to think through how might memory corruption impact what you're doing? You know, are you coding in Rust? Um, or are you coding in more of a C-based language? Um, are you using browser? Um, is it more of a web app? <laughs> so these things might actually be prevalent in what you're doing and might affect what you're doing, um, even if you're like, well, no, that's not really a thing I'm doing, but, you know, it might relate to your logic flows, so... So uh, I thought it might just be interesting. These are some of the most recent ones. Um, so we can just see that, uh, that we can see both the um, ITWs in the wild and then the variant it was related to. Um, so we can see many different ones, maybe are related, like this one's just one, but it's related to multiple different vulnerabilities. And so you kind of see that consistency of the threat actor saw this worked. It was effective. <laughs> maybe they were able to gain... 
um, some PII, maybe they were able to gain access to a system to root and then throw some ransomware on there, whatever it was they were doing. But they saw that it worked. Let me like tweak one thing. Maybe it will still work. <laughs> um, and so we'll see that kind of, kind of commonly time and time again. So, so what? There are many, many zero days. They are increasing, we think. Um, but you remember that di data bias that I mentioned earlier. They're not all related to OWASP top 10. And some are in, you know, different infrastructure. Some are in different things, but why should we care? So to me, this why should we care is really related to, it could be related, it could be connected to something that is in your tech stack, your org is using. Um, it could be something in your systems. So just kind of paying attention to the landscape for this can be impactful, even if it's not specific to your AMP. How, how do we fix it? What do we do? You know, so I, I was sharing earlier that um, many of these are related to um, previous variants. Well, one of the things that you can work on is root cause analysis. Like, what is the true reason this is happening? So not not just using, like, you know, Tuesday patch day, right? That's great. But, you know, if that patches it, someone might be working on a workaround did you analyze what originally caused that and have you fixed the root cause to it? Um, it so uh, there's some really great talks on this and resources, and I've shared those um, both in the images. Like a lot of these images, if you click on them, they themselves are resources. Um, so I recommend looking at that. Also, if that memory corruption piece is of really great concern to you, I very much recommend, especially if your project is critical infrastructure, open source, uh, trying to get it applied to the Alpha and Omega project because they are working on um, securing apps um, for free. Like they're, and they give people money also. Um, so you can apply to have your project be part of their project. Um, and so they're working on pivoting things over to maybe a more secure code language um, and providing people with resources to be able to do that. So um, that is another thing that one can work on from like a resourcing perspective and that's part of the open SSF organization. So that was our, that was our data set one. Um, I threw a lot of data at you. So I threw even more, you know, pieces of information through, you know, we think about like the hat piece, like there's three hats on the table. So we have a second data set that we're going to be taking a look at. Um, and this one will be much shorter. So as we're reviewing problems with lots of data, we can continue to look at the patterns I think it's really powerful to look at the patterns of your own data. And so that's what I did with this. So this is anonymized data from my company. Um, and we do uh, pen testing and um, continuous bug bounty testing. And so this is a 30-day set, but I actually pulled it um, additionally over uh, 90 days as well. And the numbers would not be accurate for 90, so I you know, wanted to keep it at 30. But the pattern holds true as far as frequency. So what this data tells us is injection. So the numbers down here are OS top 10. And then injection is the one that we're seeing most commonly from a bug bounty platform. This is really common across other bug bounty groups too. Because with injection, you see it. It is, it's really observable and it can maybe lead to, um, remote code execution, um, and that might lead to a higher payout for the bounty hunter, right? Like their, their goal is going to be to try to find something that is reproducible, exploitable, and then also get paid for that work. So same thing with data sets, like that's something to always take into a grain. But I think it's important to think through that this is a way that um, these vulnerabilities are being seen and the injection is of a higher frequency. Um, so you can kind of think about the so what of this, right? Um, it, so it, that's what I was just mentioning with like the larger payouts, um, it, the different issues with that, and that it's really easy to automate injection as well. So you can test that over and over and over again. Um, so it, it's okay that this data set two and the data set one didn't necessarily line up with the OWASP top 10. Like that's fine. It's kind of thinking through from your end what's going to be useful for you. Um, and so we think of like some solutioning for injection. 
Um, so it's going to involve validating inputs, <laughs> testing things, maybe use fuzzing. Uh, maybe you use a web security testing guide, which is an OWASP project. Um, it, so you can use that. Um, that is the next one. Um, so this is one of the OWASP projects um, for uh, testing things out. Um, and they have a variety of different testing guides that you can do. Um, so that could be something that you choose to do. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, that was fun. Sad face. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. We can fix this. Okay, bear with me for a moment. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Just getting to my slime. Okay, so that brings us to heart model. So, you know, we talked about the problem, right? So the problem was so many hats. So what, what do we do with that, right? Um, so we want to wade through the data and prioritize so we can threat model. So we have three hats over here, right? So one of the things that you could do is we can stack our hats. And if gravity bears with me, we can consolidate our hats. And that's what we're going to work on with threat model is taking things from a, I'm wearing all these different hats, I have all this different data, what do I do with it? Well, we're going to try to prioritize. And to me, that's where threat modeling comes in. Um, it, it comes into place because you can kind of figure out information about your system, information about um, what is crucial for you, and then work on prioritizing those things, mitigating them, et cetera, and things that maybe you need to harden because this is really critical to your specific um, tech stack, your infra, et cetera. So we think about threat modeling, and just to kind of go through like a very basic idea around it. Um, when you woke up this morning, you know, how did you, how did you get ready for the day? How did you plan out your day? Did you look at the weather, look outside? It's like, oh, it's misting a little bit, but it's not raining that hard, so maybe I'll have a hat. Oh, I need to make sure I leave at this time to get to the conference. I need to make sure that I have my badge. You know, they've identity access management here. They're going to kick me out if I don't have one, um, of course. So all these different things that you're going through as you're planning something out are threat modeling because you're, you're figuring out your scenario. You're figuring out what you want to do. So one of the things that might come up for you is you might be hungry later. Like, like do you already have plans for dinner? Do you know what you're going to do? Right? This, this conference ends at closing. So like these guys right here, it sounds like they need to make some dinner plans, right? So one of the things that we might do is we might plan out what we're going to do. So, you know, you might think through like different pieces with this. So as you're planning out like going for food, you might think through like what's already in my kitchen? Do I, do I have food? I need to check my ingredients. I need to do an inventory. Um, you might think through, okay, if I'm going to go outside... Um, I'm not going to order the grocery sent to me. I'm going to go outside. Um, I need to, you know, prepare for that adventure. Um, it, do I need to eat a snack beforehand so I'm not hungry at the grocery store? Um, it, do I need to, like, have my phone and headsets with me so no one talks to me, um, et cetera? Um, it, so you kind of think through all those different things. Um, maybe you have a roommate or a partner, family, and you need to ask them, hey, do you all need anything from the grocery store? Do you want to come with me? And then you choose your path for that. So, you know, we can think about this as like an analogy for threat modeling. You might think through like, as I'm going there, am I vulnerable? Um, what are some of the threats that might exist? Do they apply to me if at all? And then what can I do to control those? What can I do? And if you were at um, Ken's talk, like she had great analogies around ice cream, right? Um, and so thinking through like bringing those extra napkins and doing all those pieces to make sure that you're appropriately threat modeling for the situation. 
So why, why should we do this? Right. Um, and so when we think through like the why of it all, um, it, this is going to be things around, well, it's proactive security. <laughs> um, it's, it's not reactive. If we're threat modeling and we're thinking through the different issues that might happen, we're trying to use data to predict this might happen. This could be really bad for us. Let's try to get ahead of it. Um, you know, we had Tanya's talk earlier that was shifting security everywhere. So you might th want to think through how can we shift security smartly everywhere? How can it be in all parts of um, our life cycle? How can it be not just shifting left, not shifting right, everywhere, pervasive? Um, we can think about like, oh, if everything's already in prod mode, it's okay <laughs> if you haven't threat modeled before. You can, you can still start threat modeling. So it's not like there's one right time to threat model. And, you know, you can kind of think through, like, existing pieces with this, right? Um, it, so you want to think through maybe, like, different tests that you might do. And then finally, you might think through, like, the teamwork piece to it, right? So it is very cross-team. Um, it should not just be security that's working on this. It shouldn't just be one person that's working on this. Um, it, that person, hopefully, is um, sharing uh, the different hats with people and able to work together. I will walk through two models. Stride's been mentioned a lot, um, but I wanted to take Stride and make sure that we understood the different parts to it, as well as thinking about OWASP Top 10 and connection to Stride. Um, and so this is just mapping a few of them, um, but you kind of think about how spoofing and tampering might happen with um, broken access controls, um, also injection. Uh, you might think about how repudiation might happen um, also with, um, you know, roles and escalation of privileges. Uh, with um, information disclosure, if there's a cryptographic failure, you might be disclosing PII. Um, with uh, information, um, with denial of service, um, you might have um, issues of also cryptographic failure. You might have memory corruption issues too. Um, so that might come into play. Um, and then with elevation of privilege, you might have a security misconfig that leads to someone being able to do privilege elevation. Now, this is one way to look at it. Um, it's You could take other ways to map them, and these are using the broad categories as opposed to something really specific. Um, and then what you can do with this is actually make mind maps of it. So you're making visualizations of um, the different things that might be spoofing, um, the different things that might be tampering, and you're kind of thinking through, like, how might a threat actor target my system? Um, and so you can use Stride to do threat categorization, identification, um, mapping it all out as well. Another model I'm a huge fan of is the Diamond model. Um, so this one takes more of a um, threat actor focus. Um, so for example, if we're mapping some Conti activity, um, we might look at how they attacked the Scottish EPA. Um, it, they did a really wonderful threat report about that, disclosing lots of information, redacting some, of course. Um, it, so we might be able to look at some of their capability. Um, they're using RDP. Uh, we might look at some of the infra that they use and then think through their victimology. And this can be another way to map things. If we're connecting it to OWASP Top 10, um, you might think about the capabilities that a threat actor has. Are they frequently doing IAM pieces with um, taking over failures of that? Are they looking at um, doing just generalized scans and seeing, oh, this group didn't patch. Oh, proxy logon works now for them because they didn't patch and they have the system that's outdated um, so I can go and compromise that. A lot of the times it's people looking for kind of like that lowest hanging fruit piece to it. So those are two models. They're not the models. They're like a model. Um, it, there's not one the model for threat modeling. Um, there are many. Um, there's pasta. There's other ones as well. Um, if you're doing privacy, there's London. I have the cards up there if you wanted to take a look at those. Uh, so there's all sorts of different ways to model. But really one of the things you have to figure out first is choosing and creating your model. <laughs> and maybe you test out some. You think about like what's best fit for me. Uh, maybe you look at the um, threat modeling manifesto and you think about um, like some of the very generalized questions and you start there, especially if you've never done threat modeling. And then as you go through that, um, you want to think through different parts with um, 
measuring and monitoring and addressing and kind of getting to the core of what you're trying to do. And of course, documentation and communication um, with this as well. And so these are kind of like a step back, right? So these are like a, how do I get started? And then what do I do once I get started? So kind of think of this as like a meta threat model model. <laughs> um, it, so when you pick that framework, um, stage one would be really working on identification of those threats um, and defining that scope, right? Because what it is that you're threat modeling matters. You know, are you threat modeling your whole organization? I hope you're not doing that if this is your first time threat modeling. I would start much smaller. Um, it, you know, you're not going to go out and decide that you're going to cook um, beef wellington if you've never done any cooking before, if you've never done anything in the kitchen. So kind of like figuring out, like, what are your steps to get started? Um, and then choosing your model that's going to best fit that. Figuring out who are the people that you need involved. Um, and thinking through your systems and assets that you're going to use. So thinking through both the tech side of things and also the people side of things. Um, and then what it is that you're going to threat model. Uh, you know, you can start broad and then narrow um, and as far as brainstorming, but you will want to narrow your focus. So when you identify threats, this is going to be really important to have a mixture of people because you only know what you know <laughs> and other people will know different things. And so mixing it up, having a variety of folks on different teams, cross-functionality is really, really helpful for this. Um, and thinking through different tooling you want to use. So are there various application security testing things you want to use? You want to use SAS, DAS, IS, what have you, um, SCA. So what, what is it that you want to use from a tooling perspective? And then who do you want on the team with you? How are you going to go about identifying those threats? When you address the threats, um, you're going to want to think through, we have to do something with these. <laughs> if you choose to do nothing and you don't threat model, you're accepting all the threats. You're accepting the risk. Um, and so you can choose to um, you know, mitigate it and come up with a fix for it. You can choose to have a third-party service come in and you're transferring that. Um, you can choose to have it be something that, um, you know, completely gets rid of it um, and introduces it in the first place. So it just depends on what you're trying to do. Um, but these can have legal consequences. Um, these can have ROI consequences. Uh, so it is important to think through it from a business perspective as well. When you're addressing the threats, you want to prioritize. And how do you do that? So this is where this piece of all the hats comes into play. Thinking through the data sets we just looked at comes into play because when we think about likelihood multiplied by impact to assess for things, you can look at some of these data sets and see what is happening. <laughs> it's memory corruptions happening pretty frequently for these zero days, but does that impact my, my organization? Is that something that we need to think about? Is it something we need to care about? Well, it is happening. <laughs> But does it impact us? And so it, that's where looking at real breaches, looking at real things that threat actors are doing, I think is really impactful because you can think about the likelihood that this is going to happen. And then how easy is it for them to do that? Is there automated tooling around it? Um, is there, um, a, like, I'll go back to Metasploit, which I talked about earlier. Is there a Metasploit module for it, making it even easier for them to achieve those goals, um, the action on objective? So... We can use our ingredients, we can use our seasoning, and then add this all together and have this be garnished and a beautiful thing that we're doing to figure out our situation. If you've ever done any cooking or baking, you probably looked at a recipe. You may not follow a recipe, but you probably looked at one. And so documentation is incredibly important uh, because you want to be able to pass along what you are doing to others, but also you want to be able to analyze what it is that you're doing. And so if we can't document, if we're not tracking it, if we're not recording it, how can you pull any analytics around it <laughs> if you don't even know what you're measuring? So documentation is super important, um, coming up with a method for it, um, and thinking through what mitigations and outcomes you want to do. Did it work? <laughs> so you have a vulnerability you've identified. You've decided that you want to mitigate it. You now need to test it, right? Like, did it actually work, the mitigation? Um, and so you need to be able to track all those different pieces to what you're doing. Um, so 
once you have you know, figured out this is the model we want to use, we've identified some threats, we are working on documentation, we have to communicate our findings, right? And so documentation also helps with this too. Uh, but sharing out, like, who are the people who need to know this? Is this internal? Is this something we can ha have this be part of open source? Uh, is this something that um, we are going to only share with some key stakeholders, not all of them? So figuring out that piece can be very crucial. And so figuring out your best methods for communication. Is it something that you have a messaging channel for? Is it something you're sharing out a report for? Are you having like an all hands meeting, et cetera? Um, so as an organization, you have to figure out both what is our communication going to be like? Who are we communicating with it? You know, what was that methodology that we're using? So validation of this, right? Did we cover the right components? Um, it, we, we built a scope, hopefully. Um, it, was security critically assessed, especially the critical ones? Were the right people involved? And do we need any support from other teams? Did, did we find enough threats? Were, was there a range of threats that existed um, and severity types? Were there any threats that um, were on the boundary um, or third parties? Did you record any of those in a way that's visible? Are you documenting that? So allowing people to be accountable because you are documenting it. Um, and then are you acting on the threats that you found? Did you identify appropriate actions? Are the threats being mitigated or eliminated? Or are there too many threats that are being accepted for yourself as an organization? Have you raised your risk level? Um, were any mitigations documented, prioritized, and acted upon in a timely manner? And that's going to depend on your organization what timely means. Do you have the right stakeholders involved? And did you introduce a mitigation that introduced a new threat, potentially? And all of that ties into this piece around, is the approach to threat modeling working? So as an organization, can you say that we're providing value? Um, how are we measuring that? Are we looking at how many people are being trained? Are we looking at um, it, you know, the success rate of mitigations? Is your threat model being kept up to date? Or is it just do it once, forget it, never talk about it again, put it in the corner? Um, it, or are you continually assessing these things? Do you have clear acceptance criteria for the threats, for what you want to accept as a threat? And do you need to try different approaches for different stages with the maturity level of your team? So those are all things to kind of think about and consider. So. I'm going to close with a couple final thoughts, and then I'll have time for questions. So our five stages of threat modeling that we just went through, which is like a model for the model, is creating and choosing the model, identifying those threats, addressing the threats, communicating the results, and then validating, right? So you can kind of think through, like, there's many different ways to do this. It's you as a team figuring out what's going to work best for you so that you are hopefully wearing fewer hats and being proactive in security. Um, it, we have these ingredients and these seasonings, so we can maybe use the OS top 10. Um, we can use um, data from uh, breaches. Uh, you hopefully have some internal data and metrics that you can pull, and so you can use all of that combined together to see what might matter most to your organization. And the whole idea is to work on reducing that signal-to-noise ratio to try to wear a few fewer hats and to look at ways to integrate the data. Um, and so when we think through methods for integration of data, one of the things that is very current um, that's a happening thing right now is uh, threat modeling as code. And so thinking through ways to automate threat modeling can be really powerful. Um, and I have a variety of resources on that. Um, and a number of them are open wa or OWASP projects as well. So I'm going to pause here. Um, it, we have about five minutes for questions, and then it will be time to close for the conference. Um, it, but it's been amazing to speak with you. Um, thank you very much for being here for this talk, and I hope that you all had a good conference as well. So any questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, I'll leave it there for a moment, but I just wanted to show I do have sources and resources at the end. And I thank you. But then I'll go back to uh, this one.
Any questions I can answer? I might be brain dead at this point. It might be so much data that, like, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I saw a lot of alignment. So um, if you look at uh, both HackerOne and Bug Crowd release data as well, um, so you can look at um, different vulnerabilities that those two bug bounty programs release, and there's there's tremendous alignment with um, injection being one of the most ones seen. Um, so I've mainly been doing frequency analysis and comparative, um, and so you know that was one of the most prolific ones. Um, and I think also some of these are hard to measure for a bug bounty program too. So like you also have limitations of what your data set is. So measuring like the outdated component piece to it um, might be much harder. Um, like people might not be submitting bugs for that um, it, because it, that might be out of scope actually. So like they do have scoping documentation that they have to be working on too. Yeah. And the back. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I hope I don't close this. Am I am I correctly placed to be able to? I'm not sure. Is that better? Is that easier to be able to see? Um, I can also do... Uh, it's very hard to see this from an angle. You're also welcome to just come up, but... <laughs> you can see all the things. I hope that's like... Um, yeah, other questions? Well, thank you all so much, and have a great rest of your evening, and yeah, enjoy OWASP, and hope to see you for OWASP DC, that's my neck of the woods. So. Yeah.